Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, amazing webinar by Wu University called Drops to Biologics, where it all fits with Dr. Mania Madan and Dr. Mark Altis. I'm Dr. Elise Kramer, and it's my pleasure to be your host tonight. All right, so I will introduce Dr. Madan. With over 15 years of experience managing complex dry eye patients, Dr. Madan is the current president of the BC Doctors of Optometry. She's completed a residency in ocular disease at the Eye Center of Texas in Houston and is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Madan has lectured throughout North America on the management of advanced dry eye disease and glaucoma. She's published in various optometric publications, including Review of Optometry, Optometry Times, Modern Optometry, and Eyes on Eye Care. She's also a lecturer at Pacific University College of Optometry. Dr. Madan serves on the Editorial Advisory Board for Modern Optometry and Women in Optometry Publications. She's a speaker and consultant for companies including Laptician Thea, Sun Pharma, Santin, and Luminous. Dr. Madan is a member of the Canadian Association of Optometrists and also serves as a continuing education reviewer for Association of Regulatory Boards of Optometry, ARBO. Welcome and thank you so much for being here, Dr. Madan. These are her financial disclosures. With 20 years in practice and 14 years in academia, Dr. Eltis has presented and published internationally and has been sought as an expert for national television and print. He is the current president of the College of Optometrists of Ontario, Provincial Regulatory Body, and the Canadian Ambassador for the American Board of Optometry. Dr. Eltis is a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society and ACOE team chair for residency site evaluations. He has been a consultant for academic institutions overseas, law firms, and a subject matter expert for competency evaluations. Dr. Eltis has also been a previous examiner for the NBEO and the Canadian Board Examinations. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry. Dr. Eltis has practiced in New York, California, and Toronto. Welcome, Dr. Eltis. It's a pleasure to have you. These Thank are his you. financial disclosures. And um, may I just say personally, I'm very excited that there are two Canadian uh, speakers here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say and learn from you. So I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure for us to be here. And um, well, all financial relationships have been mitigated. And here we go uh, with drops to biologics, where it all fits. I'm going to start by speaking about drops. And uh, as I always say, Mania gets some more complex and important stuff. So she's going to be talking about biologics. So uh, always when I'm speaking about drops, it is kind of funny to me because I spend most of my day discussing how drops are just the beginning or the tip of the iceberg. And that dry, of course, as we all know, is treated as an inflammatory condition. And we all have incredible... Uh, treatments for it. I know Mania uh, does a lot of very advanced treatments, and we have IPL and RF and, and biologics and all those kinds of things. But when it comes down to it, drops still play an important role in the treatment of patients. And it's the first thing that patients probably have reached for or are thinking about when they're discussing or thinking about treating their dry eye. So drops provide symptomatic relief to patients, and especially during flare ups, that's what they'll turn to first. So when we talk about using drops, it's important for patients to understand that just like an antibiotic or other kinds of treatment, it's not like you can put it in once and forget about it and expect a result. It's something that needs to be continually used to build up a defense or to build up an effect. So I like to use the lip balm analogy, especially uh, you know where it's cold in, in Canada here and in the Northeast, it makes sense that you have to keep using a lip balm to get protection or better yet, you want to use the lip balm before you have symptoms because once your lips are cut, it's too late. So the same thing applies to dry eye where you want to create a defense or replenish the tears before you get inflammation and ocular surface disease. So patients shouldn't wait until they're symptomatic or until the ocular surface is compromised because just like with lips that are cracked, it's harder to repair than it is to protect. Dry eye disease is non-binary. It can't be easily classified as evaporative or aqueous deficient. We know that because the DUES-2 study found that up to 70% of sufferers have a mix of the two. 
And being in practice for two decades now and having been involved in drive for a long time, I can tell you that sure, you're going to hear some trends or a, you know, a study that comes out that seems to indicate one thing or another. But in the trenches, we've known for a long time that drive is a very complex disease, multifactorial. It's not easily categorized. And I think all kinds of diagrams that try to put things into easy categories are more for consumption, but they don't really tell the full story. Just like the tier layer now is a more complex interaction rather than just three uh, tier layers. And of course, if you look at NGD and blepharitis, it's rare to have someone who only has one, they generally have both. And uh, it's a complex mix of the two. Now, dry uh, drops or, or artificial tears don't just provide symptomatic relief. They can reduce inflammation and help prevent epithelial cell death. When chosen carefully, drops can play a significant role in the management of dryness. So even though we talk about warm compresses and lid scrubs and other advanced treatments, we don't want to ignore drops because they can be very effective. And that's where we want to sway patients towards the stuff that really works. Now, speaking of that, if you've gone to the pharmacy, you've seen there's probably at least 100 things in the aisle uh, for dry drops. It's completely overwhelming. We can't really blame patients, although we, we sometimes look down uh, at them for picking something which we don't like as practitioners for various reasons. The truth is, why would we expect them to know which one is best? They'll just pick a name that's very recognizable. So again, that's one of the reasons why I like to have drops in the office to sell to patients because it eliminates the confusion at, at least the very first time they purchase it so they can see it and know they got the right product. Because even if you write it down, a lot of products have different names or it's a little bit confusing because they'll remember one of the main brand names, but then the actual drop itself will be confusing between two or three of them. So don't think of selling drops in your office as simply for financial gain. Think it as saving them time, energy, and the anxiety of having to worry about having selected the proper product. So when I select drops for patients, I say as a prescription, if I don't have what they need in office, I write it down in great detail. Sometimes I'll even show a picture of what they're going to be picking up. So unfortunately, we can't go through all the amazing drops that are out there, and there are quite a few. We had to pick uh, some in each category to give a kind of all-around picture of what's out there. We'll clarify when they're most appropriate, and we'll simplify when to turn to biologic. So preservative in, preservatives in drops are a necessary, necessary evil in multi-dose bottles. Preservatives contain bacterial replication and they minimize contamination. However, they can be counterproductive to treating the condition. And I've given the example of an exfoliant and a lip balm. Sure, it could sometimes be beneficial, but in other times, obviously, if there's irritation already, it can cause more of a problem or, or exacerbate the irritation or inflammation. So irritants are being introduced to a compromised tear film and ocular surface. Preservative free formulations are generally superior and they're highly recommended for those using drops more than four times a day. Now in the old days, we used to say six times a day or eight times a day, you can see that number keeps going down. In my opinion, it's better to avoid preservatives altogether if you can, and sure, that means that the drop will be a greater cost, but they're definitely worth it. And that's something you want to discuss with patients, why a drop may be double or more what, they can, be, what can be found in the pharmacy, but there are clear advantages in the long run. BAK and thimerosal formulations should be avoided at all costs. They can be more toxic. Now, in terms of selecting viscosity, this can be done through objective means, if a patient has more advanced dry eye, or if we check their tear osmolarity and we see that it's high, we may want to try something with a higher viscosity. However, I personally have what would be categorized as mild dry eye, and I love a more viscous tear. Why do I like it? Because I'm lazy and I have to put it in less, and it just feels nicer in my opinion. Generally speaking, moderate to severe dry disease will probably need a thicker drop, However, there are some patients who hate them. So you want to kind of try it out in the office if possible before they spend the big bucks on a drop. Generally speaking, 
as the viscosity increases, so does the duration of effect. However, the potential for blurred vision does also increase with viscosity. Now that's not necessarily so. There are some great drops, which I'll be uh, discussing momentarily, which don't blur out vision. But again, as a general rule, that holds true. Sustained ultra hydration uh, is one of those drops which has remained a favorite. It's relatively inexpensive and effective for mild to moderate dry eye. It's moderately viscous using the coating power of hyaluronate. The drop forms a gel layer acting as a mucomimetic, compensating for a compromised tear layer and reducing friction during blinks. H. Guar interacts with the blinking motion, prolonging the contact time on the eye. H. Guar molecules bind to compromised areas of the cornea. Now, there is a non-preserved version of this drop, and it's a single dose. It's substantially more expensive. So now when we're thinking about a single uh, use drop, the price kind of equation shifts. It's uh, highly recommended if drops are being used more than four times a day. But honestly, if you want a high quality drop, I generally rec recommend a non-preserved option. Hyaluronic Intense is one of my favorite drops. It's a premium multi-dose preservative-free option, or in general for more advanced dry eye, although I use it across the spectrum of dry eye. You're not technically supposed to use it with contact lenses. I use it personally with contacts, but I wouldn't recommend it to patients in that way. I can say that it doesn't really blur out my vision. Uh, the unique multi-dose pump does not allow air to penetrate the interior, so it keeps it safe for six months of use once it's open. Now you have to write down when you opened it, that's very important because otherwise you can lose track. Some patients who may be, um, you know, who may have some joint issues, may have a more difficult time with the pump mechanism. But what I love about it is that you can use it as a water gun, you can pretty much fire it into the eye. So for some patients who are more squeamish about watching the drop, you know, come down with gravity, it can actually be fired laterally like that directly into the eye if you press the pump faster. When compared to head-to-head -head with single-dose non-preserved options, this product's cost can become more defensible because if you think about it, it has 300 drops in a bottle. What would be the equivalent cost of using 300 vials? This drop is a higher viscosity level produced by a higher concentration of heavier molecular weight sodium hyaluronate. And in my opinion, it doesn't blur vision. I haven't had too many complaints about it, it is true that it's a little bit thicker. What I liken it to in terms of what it is, it's as if Hylodual, if you're familiar with that anti-allergy drop, had a kid with Hylogel. So this is kind of the combination of the viscosity of Hylogel combined with the anti-allergy properties of Hylodual. And speaking of that, this drop contains ectoine, which is a natural anti-allergy and anti-inflammatory agent. It's effective in patients suffering from dry eye disease and allergic conjunctivitis. And it's even been shown to accelerate wound healing post-operatively. Now, another very interesting drop is still is dual gel, a single unit preservative-free thicker gel. This is an excellent bedtime option. And in fact, this is the drop that bailed me out a few years ago when I had a flare-up. I was using it at nighttime. I actually found it better than most of the ointments or other gels. It does not blur vision, but there's a definitive thickness to it, which is substantial and it, and it coats for an extended duration. It's not oily. It contains trailose, an osmoprotectant, designed to guard uh, dried epithelial cells and stabilize their membranes. Trailose protects against the destructive inflammatory cascade of dry disease. And sodium hyaluronate enhances viscosity. Carbomer also increases viscosity, and carbomer also maintains the hyaluronic acid and trailose together in contact with the ocular surface. And it does so for six hours without being sticky. Now, the single unit dose nature of the product does make it a bit more of an expensive option, but I do find for flare ups, it's extremely convenient and you don't have to you know, exhaust the entire supply at once. So I find 
it's actually quite economical if you're having a flare up because you only need to buy one or two boxes. Now, this drop is available in, this gel rather is available in a drop format, a sale is duo, and it's the same ingredients as the gel minus the carbamer, which makes sense. And it's preservative free and good for three months after you open it. Switching gears, the Calmo Spray is a unique product. Um, it's used for MGD. It's preservative free and good for six months once opened. It's really good for patients who hate drops because you can just spray it with the eyes closed onto the lid and it'll seep into the eye. So it replicates meibomian gland secretions using liposomes. And in fact, uh, there's a new product called Zaspray, which is similar in nature and it deals with dry and allergies as well. And it can be used in a similar manner with the eyes closed. So that's pretty new and exciting. It also has sodium hyaluronate and boric acid and liposomes as well. Calma spray is an excellent option for people who hate putting in drops, just like uh, Zaspray would be. And the uh, provitamin B5, which moisturizes the eye and surrounding skin, is also an interesting component. Opdays Hilo Night, uh, also known as Ocunox in Canada, is a nighttime ointment that uses vitamin A to speed up epithelial healing. Now, there can be some controversy with the effectiveness of vitamin A. I found this to be a good ointment. It's a moderately viscous ointment. It's not really super thick, preservative-free, and it's phosphate-free. I would use this in, in, in cases that don't require heavy-duty ointment, and I'm going to get to the mother of all ointments in a moment. So uh, Akinox is, is slightly oily, but not greasy. It's not slimy. And it's a uh, minimal blur that you can experience with this. I find most patients aren't bothered by it from a, from a vision standpoint. Also, I really like that they changed the, um, the opening. It used to have this little ring that would fall out once you open the, the, um, the, the case or the, or the ointment bottle, but now that's been rectified. Now, lac ref uh, refresh lacry lube ointment is the mother of all ointments. It's the go-to for very thick overnight coverage. This is a classic, it's been around for a while. It's a mineral oil base that allows melting at body temperature. Uh, white petroleum serves as a lubricant. Now, if someone's gonna use this, they better be sitting in bed by the time they put it in, especially if they put it in both eyes, because it'll blur them out. And it can be a little bit alarming if a patient isn't aware of this or hasn't tried it before. So they really need to be in a position where they're not going to be moving for a while. So I tell them ideally to do it when they're sitting in bed. They can bring a handheld mirror if it's helpful, and they can just drop it in, create the, bas the basketball hoop by pulling their lid uh, lower and then pouring in some of the lacry lube. This is if there's a severe uh, corneal abrasion or if they've got extreme dryness and need massive overnight protection. Now, my mom will kill me if I don't talk about uh, Liposic because she loves it. And a lot of older ophthalmologists love it too. It's a reasonably priced option for, for decades. It's been around and it's still kicking. You know, a lot of patients don't want to let go of it, which is fine. This drop is based on the ideology that you know, lipid layer deficient patients or MGD patients respond best to an oil replenishment drop. Now, that hasn't necessarily been my experience across the board. Like I mentioned that this disease is, uh, is non-binary, but for a lot of patients, they swear by it and they love it. And it's interestingly enough, my mom used to use the drop more so, but then after a while, she started um, using the, uh, the, the ointment or gel and she really likes it. So um, it, it's, it's one of those things where patients are hooked on it and they, they will keep using it. The drops contain carbamer and a few other ingredients. Uh, cetramide is a preservative. So again, caution with uh, patients that require a non-preserved option. Uh, lipstick gel has sodium hydroxide, which closely mirrors the pH of tiers at 7.4. It attempts to replicate all three tier layers. So maybe that might be one of the secrets to its success. Now, uh, switching gears again to Refresh Optive Mega-3, this is a single dose preservative-free drop. 
it contains omega-3 from flaxseed oil. And interestingly enough, studies show that eye drops using emollients can increase the lipid layer thickness of the tear film. So omega-3 fatty acids are actually found in the normal tear film. So it makes sense that they'd be helpful. And of course, that's why we take them by mouth as well. This product is formulated to minimize blur, it does not require shaking, and it's designed to replenish all three tear layers. It, it's targeted towards MGD patients like sustain, complete, and retain. These drops may be more helpful for patients with prolonged screen time. Honestly, that's everybody, I think, at this point. Um, in theory, a lifestyle that decreases blinking and myelin secretion. And of course, I'm sure Mani will agree, but I'm seeing dry eye now in patients who are five or six. Uh, and I really think the pandemic affected things where before we used to see it more so in middle-aged patients or in seniors. Now I can see a patient who's five or six who has demodex bleph and, and, and dry eye, which has compromised their meibomian glands. Anyway, this drop uh, has lubricants including glycerin and uh, polysorbate as well. So in conclusion, there are many other excellent products on the market for dry disease. Certainly, we didn't have a chance to, to talk about everything. There are some which are particularly available in Canada, like Evolve and Evolve Gel. But of course, uh, this wasn't an all-encompassing list, and there's other great drops. There's no magic formula or perfect drop for every patient. A careful case history will help, and that's, I think, the most important thing to talk to your patient, also discuss their preferences. Will they dislike if something's too thick or gooey? Do they want something that's watery? Are they okay with pressing on certain types of pumps, keeping in mind what you're going to propose? There will always be some trial and error in finding the right combination of product. So you don't want patients to think that one drop will be the be all and end all. Both doctor and patient need to understand this and work together. And my best advice, like with any product I use in the office, try it out yourself. You're gonna find out the little tricks of the trade and you're not gonna be surprised if the patient comes back and says, the drop didn't work, I pumped it a couple of times and the bottle is defective. For instance, that happened for me when I first started using Hilo, but now I know, of course, because I use it myself, you have to pump it four or five times before it starts to work. So you gotta try out the products to know the ins and outs, that'll give you maximum success. So with that in mind, I'll leave uh, you with Dr. Mani Madan with a more exciting part of the presentation on biologics. Hey, I'm just gonna unmute myself here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Elsas. That was actually a really great presentation. I felt like I was talking to a friend, um, you know, about their reviews on drops because oftentimes we wonder, you know, what would I recommend a contact lens wear? What would I recommend uh, another patient? So it was really nice to see that. Uh, your kind of take on all of those drops. And I mean, and, and oh boy, I mean, drops have really come a long way as well, right? Now if we can just uh, stop our patients from using Visine and baby shampoo. <laughs> I think we will win a war here. Exactly. And you just didn't say those nice things because we're friends, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> and I also really liked your suggestion of, um, you know, carrying some of these products in our practice. I think that it is such an overwhelming choice for patients. And so if we can simplify that, I really like to look at an expert and say, hey, tell me what's best for me and then go with those suggestions rather than walk into a pharmacy and be like, oh my God, I have no idea what I should choose. That's the thing. You're doing them a favor. Don't think I know. And I, you always sometimes think, and I think so too, I'm not trying to sell them stuff. I don't hope they're not thinking I'm trying to sell them stuff. But the truth is, and I've read the stats somewhere else, the presentation I was giving, but even though we think of patients going online, 70% of patients still rely on healthcare providers and look to us to offer the best products and services. So the glass, the glass is more than half full, and we should take the initiative and offer patients those choices. Absolutely. All right. So moving on to the second part of this, uh, we started off with uh, uh, recommending our patients with uh, eye drops. And now how do we now turn this into and what, when do we need to use blood biologics? So another form of an eye drop for our dry eye patients. And so when is a good time to turn into blood biologics? Well, I'll kind of shake things up a little bit and start with a, um, uh, a case. Uh, so this was a patient of mine that uh, was referred to me for dry eye. Um, you know, nothing, nothing outstanding in, in terms of her symptoms. We've all heard this burning, redness, sandy irritation. Uh, she reports that she's constantly using drops, right? So now we're starting to talk about those moderate 
uh, dry eye patients that uh, have tried perhaps a lot of over-the-counter lubricating drops and perhaps are doing some other things. Uh, she says she's also been to the ER with uh, flared up red eyes, um, you know, that uh, that really bother her. And so this is kind of the treatment that she's on. Well, we can tell from her medical history that she's got Sjogren's. Well, we know that affects her eyes severely. She's also had breast cancer and sarcoidosis. Um, she's on preservative-free artificial tears every couple of hours. She's on Zydra twice a day, hot compresses, omega-3, tea tree oil, lid wipes, moisture goggles. And then every time she goes to the ER, she's given Tobradex, right? Um, and so as you can see from this, she's doing a lot, right? And she's doing a lot and yet she's still presenting with her eyes feeling dry and not appropriately managed. And you kind of look at that treatment plan and you think, well, what else can I add? And what else can I do for this patient? And, and dry eye certainly has changed a lot over the last few years and how we managed it. And Dr. Elt has alluded to it as well. We have so many in-office technologies now. And, and of course we now have blood biologics. So I kind of want to show you how in this patient and where that uh, fits in. Now, this is what her ocular surface looked like. And of course, now if we're doing a thorough exam on our patients and looking for signs of dry eye, we are using our staining to look at staining on the ocular surface. And you can certainly see that on her cornea there. Sorry, I'll go back to that picture. And then you can also see some staining on her conjunctiva. Of course, we will look into mybographies as well if we're doing that thorough uh, evaluation. And we also have other tools that we can utilize like Inflamadry to check for inflammation, like osmolarity. And I'll kind of get into those a little bit more um, uh, later on. But you can see that there is some meibomian gland dysfunction. I mean, this is a Sjogren's patient. Did we you know, we, we are expecting some dry eye, but are we also expecting uh, her meibomian glands not to look good? And if you look carefully at the lid margin, I can appreciate some blepharitis, maybe some eyelid tail injectasia. So I'm also thinking, does this patient have ocular rosacea? And so here's just a little bit better view of that eyelid with the eyelid, uh, eyelid tail injectasia. Now, here's just a side note on Sjogren's. I mean, often we think of Sjogren's as a disease that is just aqueous deficient. We really didn't think that it would affect our meibomian glands, but there are now studies that show us that patients with uh, Sjogren's syndrome show higher meibomian gland dropout than normal controls. And this may be just due to the increased inflammation that patients with Sjogren's can have, uh, which can then also affect their meibomian gland. So very, very important that if you are evaluating patients with Sjogren's disease to make sure that we are paying attention to their oil glands as well, and to offer treatments that will help stimulate not only the aqueous deficient part of their dry eye, it's a mixed etiology and also targeting their meibomian gland dysfunction. A recent survey of the members of the Sjogren's Syndrome Foundation revealed that the the symptoms of dry eye were the most activity limiting aspect of Sjogren's disease. Now, this was a survey that included over 3000 patients that had Sjogren's sy syndrome. And as you know, with Sjogren's, I mean, it really is a multi-system disorder of, of our body. And so many uh, different organs can be affected, including kidneys, your lungs, um, they can have debilitating fatigue, but these patients found that dry eye was the most activity limiting aspect of their disease. And not only was it activity limiting, but it was also very expensive. They felt the financial burden from the treatment of dry eye uh, that they had to keep up with. Now, once viewed as a painful nuisance, dry eye disease today is considered a critical and significant public health issue. This was actually published in Ophthalmology Times in 2021, just in the middle of that pandemic uh, stuff that we were going, going through. So there's certainly been a, a huge change in, in how we have viewed dry eye and, um, and what we're seeing in our practices. I love some of these prevalence numbers and, uh, you know, and I, I, I'm always shocked to kind of read them. But nearly half of the patients that now present to our practices in an ophthalmology or optometry practice, you know, now have dry eye related complaints. So that's half of the patients that, that present to us or in an ophthalmology practice. In fact, a patient suffers with dry eye symptoms 6.5 years before they even present to an eye doctor. 
And 41% of them feel that their dry eye is actually underestimated. And they often go to three different practices on average before they even find any relief from their dry eye. 80% of the patients want something a little bit more effective. And here's the financial burden. I mean, $1,300 is what, you know, and that's US. So that's like a million dollars in Canada. That's what they are on average spending on dry eye treatment. So it can be very, very costly. Um, and this industry is, is set to increase to $6.2 billion in the over, over, over the next few years. So why treat dry eye? You know, I mean, I think these numbers really tell us a lot. It's obviously going to improve our patient's quality of life. It's, it's an opportunity for us to have better clinical outcomes for our patients, not only surgically, but if they're wearing contact lenses or how they are, you know, even working with their glasses and how they are performing on the computer. It's definitely a, an opportunity for practice growth and practice retention for these patients when we don't want to be the practice where they leave to go find relief somewhere else. And so this is impacting a huge amount of patients. And I think that it really makes sense for us as optometrists to really hone into this condition. So let's talk about dry eye a little bit. Um, we've all seen this definition, this multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by loss of homeostasis of the tear film. I'm really gonna ask you to put a little bit more attention on the word tear film. You know, So this definition says loss of balance, loss of homeostasis of the tear film. It doesn't say loss of balance of the cornea. It doesn't say loss of balance of the lids. It says the tear film. So something so incredibly amazing about our tear film that once we lose balance of that tear film, we have so many problems. You know, not only do we get corneal and conjunctival and eyelid damage, but we also see that it hugely impacts our patient's quality of life and patients go, oh my God, this, this really sucks. So what is it about this amazing tear film um, that's contributing to all of that? Now, this is the dry eye treatment plan that has been put forth by DUES2. It's, it's a systematic approach of managing that dry eye, managing that tear film, and how to bring homeostasis, how to bring balance back to that tear film. And you can kind of see, you know, where everything fits in. Dr. Eltis talked about the artificial tears, and we can see that, you know, and I really want us to think of this as a building ladder, right? We don't jump right to the fourth rung of the ladder. We really want to do a systematic approach as we build on you know, the first part, the second part, and third part. And I really wanted to show you where does blood biologics currently fit into the DUES2? And you can kind of see it right there with serums and PRP, and recombinant growth factors, amniotic fluids, um, and, uh, and, and amniotic membranes there in, in that arena there. So let's talk about how did blood biologics really start and why do we think that blood biologics can help dry eye? Well, it turns out that blood biologics is not something new. It's been around for a long time. We've known that our blood actually has a lot of healing powers. In fact, 1534 BC, if you can read Egyptian, was the first reference of blood use. And I, I feel like it's right there where my arrow is pointing. Um, and then fast forward many thousand years later, in 1975 was the first time blood biologics was used in the treatment of dry eye. Ralph and et al. and his colleagues actually told their patients to prick their finger and squeeze that blood right into their eye to help with their uh, dry eye symptoms. Now, we don't do that anymore, but that was one of the first uh, studies that came out and talked about it. And fast forward to 1984 is when we actually saw autologous serum. Now, we've also seen the applications of platelet-rich plasma or blood biologics in other areas of medicine. We know what happens in orthopedics where they're injecting PRP into uh, injured joints to allow for healing. We also see PRP in, uh, in hair loss where it's injected right into the scalp to help the hair grow. And we also see it being very made popular by our very favorite Kim Kardashian who uses uh, PRP with microneedling as part of her vampire facial. And, and that's also part of just skin rejuvenation and harboring some of the healing energies of PRP. We also see it in dentistry and also in ophthalmology. Now, blood biologics, you know, can get a little bit confusing, and I want to kind of simplify it. There's autologous serum, there's PRP, PRGF, and PRF. And what does this all mean? Well, they're all components of blood. 
So basically what we're doing is we are um, drawing the patient's blood and centrifuging it. So we are separating the components of the blood and, um, and all of those different things will just contain different amounts of growth factors. And so the two most common ones that we see in eye care are platelet-rich plasma and autologous serum. So let's talk about a little bit about them. Well, as Dr. Eltis mentioned, I mean, it's really hard to treat a dry eye without having a lubricating drop, right? So every dry eye needs a lubricating drop, but what, how do we know what is the most perfect lubricate, lubricating drop for our eye? And so we really need to turn to what our tear film contains, right? Remember, it's the loss of the balance of the tear film that creates all of these problems. So what is it about this tear film that, that you know, we need to bring balance to? Well, it turns out that the human tear film actually contains over 1,800 different no known molecules. It is the most perfect lubricant. It contains antimicrobial activities, anti-inflammatory activities, and nourishing activities to help um, heal our cornea to help maintain the clarity of our cornea. And here's actually a really important and fancy word. Um, our tear film is epitheliotropic. What that means is that it can support the proliferation, migration, and differentiation of corneal and conjunctival cells, okay? So it can support the proliferation, migration of actual corneal and conjunctival cells. And that's not something any of the over-the-counter lubricating drops are able to do. Now, this magical uh, word, and I'll kind of, uh, you know, explain it a little bit more. What does it mean, you know, this epitheliotropic and what is it in the tear film that is doing that? Well, let's talk a little bit about PRP. Well, here is how we get PRP. Um, so if you remember from your biology class, our blood contains plasma, which makes about 55% of the total blood volume. The red blood cells are about 41% in our blood. And then small amount is platelets, less than 1%. And then we've also got white blood cells, eosinophils, basophils. And what PRP is basically taking everything else out of your blood and just keeping the platelets and plasma. So we get platelet-rich plasma. So once we collect a patient's blood and we get rid of all those other cells by centrifugation, what we're really left with is just platelets and plasma. And you might ask why platelets? Well, it turns out that platelets, this little guy, actually contains growth factors. Okay, so these growth factors are the ones that are responsible for cell growth generation of um, and repair of blood vessels and collagen production. So when we talk about that fancy word epitheliotropic, well, it's these growth factors that uh, are epitheliotropic. So they uh, promote wound healing, they promote angiogenesis, and they can regulate uh, the growth of conjunctival and corneal cells when, our, when they are in, in our tear film. So our natural tear film contains these growth factors and, and so does uh, the platelets which are within our blood. Plasma, which makes up 55% of the blood also contains all of these wonderful things as well. It contains albumin and fibrinogen and immunoglobulins that help fight infections. And so it contains over 600 different molecules that continue to work together to again, support that cell cellular healing. And now when we put these things together, PRP, uh, you know, tends to be very, very high in growth factors, vitamins, fibrinogen, cytokines, and all of these things promote cell migration and adhesion of epithelial cells to stroma and can really play a big, big role in tissue repair. Um, now, here's a study that kind of looked at the similarities between our own natural tear film and, and platelet-rich plasma. And you can see uh, right on the top there that osmolarity and pH are pretty well matched in, in the tears and also in PRP. And that's actually not uh, hard to match in over-the-counter lubricating drops either. We, you know, we do have lots of lubricating drops that will have matched the osmolarity of our, our natural tear film and match the pH. And if they don't, of course, they sting a lot, as we see in in, in some of the medications that we use for, um, you know, for various things like glaucoma or whatnot. And, but here are the things that really set, you know, set this apart from uh, over-the-counter lubricating drops are these immunoglobulins. And so they're there to fight infections. And you can see that you can find them in tears and in PRP, 
there are all of those bunch of growth factors again that you can see in in both of those liquids there in tears and PRP and then of course lots of these other more healing agents. So in terms of summarizing everything, the benefits of blood biologics are, of course, tissue repair because of these wonderful growth factors, anti-inflammation because of the wonderful cytokines, prevent infections. I mean, our own tear film has the capability of preventing infections because it contains immunoglobulins and so does your platelets and repair osmolarity and be a natural analgesic that can help reduce pain. And, you know, when we do match the pH and osmolarity and we don't have any preservatives added to these things or any stabilizers, uh, blood biologics can be a very natural option for our patients. Now, here's a patient that I've seen in my clinic that, uh, that used PRP eye drops and you can see uh, the result in corneal healing that can happen with the use of PRP. Now, here's a question that I often get asked. Well, what is the difference between autologous serum and platelet-rich plasma? And hopefully some of these pictures will help clarify that. Autologous serum, again, we start with um, collection of blood from the patient. And autologous serum actually uses clotted blood. So once you collect the blood from the patient, you actually let the blood clot. And when you clot the blood, the platelets will release their clot and kind of wrap around the blood cells. That's how they stop bleeding in our bodies when we cut ourselves. And when you centrifuge that, the platelets will settle at the bottom of the test tube because that's where the clotted blood is. And what you'll be left on top is this serum. So there's no platelets in serum. It's the content of platelets. And in fact, platelets have settled down at the bottom of the test tube. PRP, on the other hand, uses unclotted blood. So we do not let the blood clot when we make PRP. In fact, blood is kept in its most true form and we just simply centrifuge it and allow the red blood cells to settle. And with that, we keep the platelets in their most intact form as well. They have not been activated. They have not released their growth factor, all of the content that's inside the platelets. And, and, you, and you get these platelets that are in their true form containing their own growth factors. And so you'll see this in PRP, you'll see this layer of uh, red blood cells at the bottom and you'll see this platelet rich plasma area. And then you'll have this plasma, which is the 55% of uh, you know, our blood volume kind of sitting on top, which as you know, also contains a lot of healing uh, molecules. So when we take PRP, we're really just discarding the red blood cells and then keeping the platelet rich plasma and the plasma um, and using that in our patients for healing. So if I were to just break that down into a chart um, and, and kind of provide you some differences between autologous serum and PRP, well, one of the main differences is we can just see from, um, from those uh, two drawings of how how these two things are derived, we can see that PRP contains platelets, whereas autologous serum does not. And because platelets are really the star of the show, because they are the ones that contain a lot of growth factors, we find that um, there is higher concentration of growth factors and plasma factors on PRP when compared to autologous serum. And also these growth factors are released in a more biologically relevant ratio and not just kind of everything released at once. PRP tends also not to contain any inflammatory cytokines. You might have also heard that autologous serum can contain high amounts of trans growth fat, uh, factor beta. That's a growth factor that in high amounts can actually suppress wound healing. But uh, in PRP, you know, we don't worry about that because it's actually released in a biologically relevant ratio rather than just all at once. For this reason, PRP is often not diluted. It can be dispensed 100% to the patient. If you've worked with patients with autologous serum, you know you might have noticed that autologous serum is usually dispensed autologous 20 or autologous 50. Autologous 20 means 20% 20 autologous serum, that yellowish liquid, and then 80% saline. Or autologous 50 would mean 50% autologous serum and 50% saline. And really what we're doing by, you know, why we're diluting is because we're trying to dilute this TGF beta uh, growth factor in, in autologous serum. But by also dilute, diluting the autologous serum further, we're, we're diluting the amount of growth factors that are present in it. 
So for many of these reasons, um, uh, PRP is considered superior to autologous serum and it is used more often in medicine. We don't see the application of autologous serum in any other uh, areas of medicine. We only see it in eye care, whereas all other areas of medicine use uh, platelet-rich plasma. Now, here's a, a study that was a very small study, but, uh, but very interesting, and it looked at you know, active Sjogren syndrome uh, group had significantly higher expression of inflammatory cytokines when compared to inactive uh, Sjogren's, uh, secondary Sjogren's group. Um, and, and so what they found was that if your patients um, are in the active stages of an inflammatory condition like Sjogren's, that there may be more inflammation within their blood. And then when you go ahead and make autologous serum from those patients from drawing their blood, that there was a higher amount of these inflammatory cytokines. And this is where trans factor beta came into place as well. And they found that higher amounts of it was actually um, seen as poor response to autologous serum in patients. And so, you know, sometimes we see these patients where you put them on autologous serum and you're not seeing the consistent results with it, or you're, or you're not seeing that they are getting better. And so something, you know, might might to consider here, um, you know, depending on what disease stage and what other autoimmune conditions they might be having. Now, here's a study at uh, that looked at PRP. Um, this is by Alio Jorge. Now, he's done a lot of work in this field. And if you kind of Google, you'll see a lot of studies by Alio uh, for the last 10, 15 years. And, and he's He's presented with some really, really good studies to talk about um, the effects of PRP in our dry eye patients. And so this study contained over 300 patients, and they found that there was an 87.5% improvement in the OSDI score. So patients actually felt better when they were using PRP. 76% of them had decreased corneal staining. So not only did they feel better, but we also noticed that they were getting better, and they only needed one round of PRP, and that's usually two to three months. So 64% of the patients only needed one round of PRP as monotherapy. So pretty significant results with this study. Now, this was a really interesting study that uh, looked at, again, platelet rich in growth factors, which is super concentrated PRP, platelet rich plasma, so higher concentration of growth factors than even there are in PRP. And this was an independent study, meaning it didn't have any financial disclosures. It was out of um, Department of Ophthalmology, Duke's Eye uh, Center, Baskin Palmer. And um, so very credible study. And they looked at not only just dry eye, but different areas of ocular surface disease. So you can see these patients with corneal ulcers, neurotropic, um, and cicatricial conjunctivitis, and and they looked at to see how many of them would improve if they used PRGF. And across the board, they found uh, at least a success rate of around that 76%, which is what Alio Jorge had found. And they also looked at um, the SAN score, which is equivalent to the OSDI score. At the start of this, the study, I mean, these patients had very, very high symptoms, you know, 90 84, 7,500, and you can see the drop of symptoms. So patients also felt uh, much, much better across the board, not just with dry eye, but with many other areas of um, atolic, of, of PRP. Uh, some other really great studies, another uh, one that looked at um, areas of recurrent corneal erosions, and you can see the major recurrent erosions went down to minor uh, and minor uh, recurrent erosions also reduced with the use of PRP. And here was another study that looked at the use of PRP for um, in the treatment of neurotropic keratitis. As we know, with neurotropic keratitis or other uh, er you know things that have been on the rise with uh, nerve regenerative recombinant nerve growth factor. And so this was a study that looked at well. Are we seeing regeneration of nerves? You can see a normal confocal microscopy of corneal nerves and in the picture A, and this is a patient with evaporative dry eye disease, and you can see that there is some corneal nerve loss and then uh, a little bit more in aqueous deficient dry eye due to that inflammatory component. And so here are some results with uh, PRP, looking at again uh, with confocal microscopy with just three month use. And you can see there's an improvement on confocal microscopy. So it'll be really interesting to see if we see more data in this with neurotropic keratitis. Now, who can benefit from blood biologics? Well, really anyone, mild, moderate to severe dry eye disease, aqueous and evaporative, neurotropic and neuropathic, corneal ulcers, 
Um, and so here's another patient that I've seen in my practice. And I, and, you know, and I don't think that one treatment is a silver bullet for anything. And you can also appreciate some of the lid disease in this patient, but that cornea looked to me, um, you know, really needing some rehabilitation and some corneal healing. And so this was a patient that used PRP for about six weeks. And you can see such a significant difference in this patient. And this was about three and a half months later. So pretty significant results there. Now, um, in terms of uh, the cycle of dry eye disease, I, you know, I really love looking at this uh, chart because it talks about you know, this vicious cycle of dry eye disease on the outer cycle, you can see all of these factors that contribute to tear film, its instability. Once we kind of start to control those, whether it's blepharitis, whether it's allergies, whether it is, you know, contact lens overuse and um, that are kind of leading into this tear film osmolarity, I think then we can um, start to control some of that cell damage that can result and uh, PRP can really help with a lot of those things because of those growth factors in helping to correct uh, the tear osmolarity. I wanted to talk a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds about tear osmolarity. I think that it's a very underutilized test and it gives us a lot of information. So think of your tear film as the ocean that all the fish are in and, and are healthy. So when our oceans are healthy, the fish is healthy. And when the ocean starts to change, that's the change in osmolarity, concentration of solutes in the tear film or in our ocean, well, sooner or later, the fish can start to die. So measuring tear osmolarity can really start to give us clues of early, early dry eye disease, you know, those changes in the ocean. Um, and if we can start to measure that and help correct that in our patients can have a really significant effect. You can actually just see from this slide from the last one that Change in, in is osmolarity is very toxic to the corneal surface, and you will start to lose some of these microvilli. And now you may not get any corneal staining at this point, but this patient has suffered already a lot of change on that ocular surface due to that uh, the stress of the hyperosmolarity. And then this is what happens that eventually it will lead to cell death. Now, here was a study that actually looked at the treatment of PRP to see if it actually helps osmolarity, right? So this would be some earlier changes and pretty significant results. Um, you can see the chart on the left. It's right eye and left eye, and the data is for 15 days and 30 days. There was about 90 patients in this study, and, uh, and what, what they found was that the average osmolarity of the dry eye patients was around 315, and it actually went down by 10 to 12 points at day 15 and slightly more at day 30 in each of the eyes. So very, very significant stuff. Now, blood biologics don't have to be first line, right? But we also don't have to wait until things are end stage to implement a therapy like this. Back to our interior decorator patient that we started off with. So this was a patient that had Sjogren's. And, uh, you know, we also wanted to concentrate, make sure that we uh, protect her oil glands. And so she also had IPL therapy in our practice and used a PRP eye drops and uh, really saw some uh, great results with that and, and was able to not use um, eye drops all the time and, uh, and help improve the quality of her life. Now, these are some of the questions you may be having. Well, this sounds all great, but how do I access PRP? How do I access these blood biologics? And, you know, and I am kind of sad to say that there aren't a lot of systems out there that are available, especially in eye care that make PRP drops for us, for us to be able to use for our patients. But, you know, you, there are some that are available that you're going to be able to find. You can work with some pharmacies and or you can look at implementing some of these depending on your state laws, you know, within your clinics as well. Here's some of the other applications of PRP that we're seeing that's uh, um you know, they've been injected into lacrimal glands to see if we can see some growth in Sjogren's patients and also injected into um, meibomian glands. So these studies are obviously very, very new and uh, we don't have good clinical data on these. 